the performance is always real. There are real presences. The actors are present. As you watch, you begin to consume their bodies. You want to take everything in, but at the same time, you're pushing the performance into the invisible memory. The performer has spent herself. Nothing is saved. You cannot put a price on her performance. Perhaps it has no value at all. The person that you asked for that performance is dead. You have no memory of her, but you remember the others, your comrades, the ones living outside the law. Wednesday, 6th of October, 1976. Roxborough Town Hall. One show only. Three adults and 21 children. The hall costs $30. We leave right away after the show and drive straight through to Dunedin. Arrive 3 a.m. The puppeteers see a rainbow in a field. Thank you. Just a minute. Do I know you? I remember you. Why did you keep going on and on and on? Look! Red Mole's Cabaret, gone west, shoot up at the short over. 8th of October, 1976, Fortune Theatre. Everything went wrong! It was 17 years ago. I've got all the memories here in this suitcase. I'm gonna find an empty room. I'm gonna build a memory room. Why? To keep the romance alive. Keep going on and on and on. And to travel forever. And I moved into that house and Sally was living there also. I don't remember a great deal, but I remember I'd, I'd be sitting in my room writing and no one was really much interested in what I was doing, which was fine. But Sally was curious, and I remember just a few occasions when, when I could tell she was interested to learn just what I was up to, sitting in my room and scribbling. And I don't think I ever showed her anything, but it was, um, it was an interest that I really appreciated at the time and um, felt was uh, friendly curious and um, I was very young then, I was a student at the university. Hello. Are you the caretaker? Yes. Do you have a room? Yes, just come in if you want to have a look. Don't know why you're coming. But sometime after that, I remember Sally went away. She went overseas. And I didn't see her again until Wellington, some years later, two or three years later, probably. And she'd been overseas, and she, I think she met up with Alan overseas. They'd known each other previously. They were just founding, I think, White Rabbit Puppet Theatre came a little before Rick Mole Enterprises, as it then was. But um, I was living with Jan, and they were interested in using Jan as a musician for their shows. So I kind of just drifted into the orbit of that involvement, really, through Jan. And I just kind of moved into writing for Spleen, and Alan and Sally, in those days, it seemed to me, were the first people who were prepared to take me as seriously as I took myself. <laughs>
And my memories of Wellington that entire year of Carmen's. Yes. There was just one route, and it was through Claremont Grove, and it was down Marjorie Bank Street, down Courtney Place, yes. to Victoria Street, turn right into Victoria Street, and up two flights of stairs to the balcony. And I still, Wellington is still that way to me. How did you, you know? and Debbie ever come to come to the balcony? I, I don't know. I just remember that Deb blew the fire eating. And then she yes. got the idea. She'd heard yes. about Carmen, and she said, I'm, "I've got to earn some money, mm. and, see and I'm right. going to see if I can sell my so fire eating act yes. too." So she was the great Volcana. Well, that should work. Yeah, you put twenty cents in. Yeah, yeah. it is. Oh, sure. That'd be right with the lid up. Yeah, that's Look. fine. Oh, that bloke in the white suit—that's Arthur, and it used to be in your show. Yeah, that's right. Did you come to them? Some of them, yeah. Yeah, that's Arthur. <laughs> Arthur Basting. That within a couple of weeks, she said, what else can you do? And Deb said, oh, well, I've got this where we do the tango. Tarawiki Street, number 33 Tarawiki Street. And it's off Richmond Road. Now, the street we're looking for off Richmond Road is called Parawai Street. And it goes off. We were all living in Wellington and working in Wellington. And Sally and Deb had become involved with the balcony and the strip show there. And then the opportunity came along that maybe um, Carmen would rent, this, rent us the space and a group of people would be able to put something on there on a regular basis that maybe would make us a, a little bit of money, that maybe we could make a living out of just that. And um, I don't think any of us thought it would be as successful as it was, or as exciting as it was, actually, as it all turned out to be. <laughs> Do the Irish oh, It's a yes. great one of Neville. Yes, that's stunning. Do we have a car stopped up there? That's a yes. stunning number. Do you remember how they used to get so upset to show their boobs? <laughs> <laughs> the first time I ever yes, went to Carmen's, uh, before the Red Mile came, I remember Gypsy sang the Ballad of the Wahina. That's it. right. I was just going and to say And she that. minded it. That, and right. you, I, I was astonished because people say it got weird when Red Mole went in. You were cooked straight. You had this costume which That's was right. all these blue and green ripples. Yes, she did. And yeah. when the when yeah. the Wahini was going down, yeah. you were right out at the end of the of the catwalk, yeah. and you were dancing and getting very vigorous. I think and it was, I mean, you were actually being cooked straight. I've yes. never forgotten it. That's right. Don't move. You <laughs> don't move. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sit at the top of the stairs to make sure the police never came up. Um, I saw the police coming up, we had to press the buzzer to let ring the... And it would ring at the bar. Yes. And the viewers would put the whiskey under That's the right. bar. Yeah. And I remember you had a waddy, a wooden thing yeah. under your cushion that you sat on. <laughs> I did. For people who were too pissed and got oh, out no. in the fight. Yeah, that's right. Mm. What I actually remember is for the first months, it was the, the local crowd. They went theatre people, it was like the Duke of Edinburgh. Yeah, it was. Right? <clears throat> and then after a while it got really trendy. Yes. And all these sort of trendy people used to come in and, it com and the audience really changed after a while. Mm. You know, I mean, there were still the originals, but it was kind of TV people would come and it was suddenly the place to go. Yeah, it was. And it wasn't like quite that. the same either, mm. you know. Yeah, it was. But it just got so packed, I could just never believe how busy it used to get. Mm. Mm. Just word of mouth oh, just went boom. Okay. Right some gross eating. Here's some gross eating. Okay. Gross <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember how you were so shy to reveal your boobs? <laughs> you said, well, we've got to because the girls yeah. are stripping. We oh, have to do something. something. Yeah. I think my uh, first experience yes. in the dressing room at the back of Carmen's was the most incredible thing of my mm. life, actually. I yeah, thought it was girls. With all, all our all strippers them. back mm. there. Mm. Mm. Oh, it was fantastic. It was like a carnival. But that camera right. number you did when you came out was No, we us. thought you were the carnival. Oh, no, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, we did. I thought you were amazing. Why was this a slot? I thought, yeah, why was this a slot? It's true. Oh, that was yeah. fantastic. And I remember that wonderful phrase when people used to say, I'm going, she's going to turn. Oh, yeah, she's, she's going to turn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Watch it, she'll turn. <laughs> she'll turn. <laughs> Where people, especially early on, it was so out of nowhere because the first things you did were actually um, futurist plays, like yeah. from Italian writers in the 20s or something, like totally surreal. Yes. And there was always yes. this whole element where you never knew what was going to come up next. 
You had no, no idea what was going on. And I didn't know half the time either. But there were so many strange things. There were so many strange things. And people would talk about it because mm, um, it's a bit huge every week the show changed. Day, what used to piss happen. me off, I must say, is that it would take three weeks to get a show really happening right. The first night when the critics came was always a rehearsal. It was always dreadful. And as soon as the show was right, you changed it. The godfather, but it was actually the committee, said, right, oh, next week it's a completely new show. So, you know, just when you thought you were getting it together and everything was working, new Not show. Boring, and so yeah. three weeks there would be a show and then a completely new one and a completely new one. And it had to be like that, but it was incredibly insecure because a lot of us had no background in theatre or all acting worked. or anything. You all worked so hard. Everybody works so well. We all lived in the same house, so you couldn't actually yeah. escape it. Really. But you still worked. I mean, it was just, you know, all those costs. And I looked at the um, one of the pay things in that book there, and it said, Arthur's fees, $10. $10. $10. <laughs> <laughs> What's the whole thing? Well, you get really worth a thousand in those days. That was the takings, all carefully. Oh, no, everything was divided, divided up. Divided up. Yeah. So that's the true. takings, that it? toll it just rang and rang. It did. When it <laughs> just got, well, the whole lot of really struck on something. But there yeah. were so many people. It was just so busy, yeah. yeah. wasn't it? There were yeah. so many people. Yeah. Yes, there was. By the time it was all divided out. But everybody, and what about the guest artists when they came in? They had no idea what they were getting into when they came on. But boy, they came off laughing when they came out. <laughs> Didn't they, all the guest people? That <laughs> no, no, but there were some really interesting guests that worked in that place. And yes. I can't think of... Beaver. Of Beaver. 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 There was musicians, Chrissy? there was like... Oh, Chrissy Crochet. You know Chrissy Crochet yes. is still singing in Wellington. Is she? Is she? She's just thrown out her husband. Well, because Gypsy's now Gary. Gypsies, really? yes, gypsies and boys' clothes now, short back and sides. And <sighs> Dion's a boy again, too. Dion's got his own um, hairdress and salon in Karori. It's the new anchor, mm. light chocolate. On the main road in Karori, it is. So, you know, mm. that's, they're all sort of, you know. What well, about Vicky? Two. Um, <laughs> two. <laughs> 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 yeah. Gone back to normal. <laughs> Vicky, now who was. Uh, oh, I am, it is upsetting. I don't want to remember the end. No, I don't. I don't. The balcony was something, and Red Mole, that's something a part of your life that you remember. It's like six o'clock closing. Anybody that remembers six o'clock closing never forgets it. I don't think you ever forget it. It was sad. Very sad. When Red Mole came along, we were into the vanity trip with sequins and all that sort of thing, and they brought something that made us communicate more with what we call today real people. And that's where Jeanette and I sort of, you know, got basic. We don't mind being slobs in our own house now. No, that's yeah. true. We did get We really basic. learned a lesson from them. We learned a lot of real things. At the end of Red Mole Men, the disappearing from our lives of colourful personalities, life, full of life, they went over sister and see them for years, we missed them. And bumping into them occasionally is really refreshing. More so than friends, like, you find out when you who your friends are when you move, but when you bump into the slot, they're just the same old people. You're more wrinkles, but the same old people. And very real. Go on, Jane. Yeah. But Red Mole and Sally and Debbie, they did teach us something. We thought we knew it all till we met them. And we didn't. We didn't know it all. When Sally, they taught us a lot. When they brought their cabaret into the strip club, they brought sincerity and something different that we could stand and watch. That's it. Oh, uh, well, they, their creativity was just beyond our thinking at the time. It just stood us still. It really did. What about the you first know? time you saw Sally? Can you remember that first time? Oh, the first time I saw Sally, I thought, what wackos. <laughs> what wackos, they'll never make a dime. They had packed houses, the till ringing, they had to refurbish, get builders in to reorganise the belt and everything. So, you know, I was just amazed. But the first time you met her, didn't you meet her? They just knew what they were doing and they were going for it and they did it. The first time you met Sally and Debbie, mm -hmm. didn't you meet them? Were you working at the nightclub then when they started there? Yeah. Well, you know, there were two girls with, who, you know, could wear such courageous outfits and brave makeup and what got me, you know, ex express themselves just and two straight girls coming into a, a club where there were seven queens and seven girls of all walks of life, and these two walked in and. 
fitted in so well. Everybody was polite to them. Everybody wanted to help them because they just gave those sort of vibes that, well, that they, they respected all what we, they were doing out in the restaurants. And everybody loved them. Everybody did. There was no cattiness or anything. Here's these two little outside girls. <laughs> Sally coming in and just wanting to... They just wanted to learn everything that was going on. But they taught all us a lot. At the show. Red Mole was there with such exuberance. And then they were gone. Yes. The youth must have had glue from A to B and all the rest of it. Scissors, all the cuttings. Yes, yeah, didn't care. It's no. not a shambles, but the end product was brilliant. Did you keep all your costumes, Maureen? Got a few. Have you? Yeah, yes. kept a few in our dress up boxes. Threw a lot out. Yes, exactly. we gave a lot we to Jay. Yes. Yes. One day yeah. on counters that Rosie wears around. Six year olds are passing yes. around. <laughs> <laughs> She's more still got a few sequin frocks, haven't you? Mm. I like this every time, especially just to collect my mail. Nobody loves me. Now, Alan. Alan doesn't look as though he's got any remember all those lines? Alan doesn't look as though he's got any lunch. Should have padded, should have, well, where is it? <laughs> Shouldn't have. He should have padded his lunch. <laughs> it was this makeup that Debbie used to wear, it was so severe, wasn't it? What one, not what number was that one? Can you remember what number that was? No, I can't. No, I can't, no, actually. I can't. No. If they were any, like, all of us, she's had to find a way to make a living. Oh, mm -hmm. You know, because the, the theatre has never, ever really been able to do that. So she's doing that, but she still makes masks, and she's making her own show, and her mother is going to bring her back here. Oh, good. Oh. In December. In December. In December. Oh, oh stunning. Just for a visit. Well, for the summer, I think. Mm. Okay, well, she'll stay. But That's she good. might stay. Does that, that mean that... that she will bring, she'll bring Gemma Yu, yep. who's her daughter, yep. who's six, Great. but who speaks Spanish, and it's going to be strange, I think. Oh, But the true. funny thing is that Jeannie's, you know, Jeannie McAllister with a long hair. Yes, yes. Who used to sing with yeah. Beaver and everyone. We're staying with her in Avondale. And her best friend that she's made in Avondale is a Spanish woman called Julia. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, who speaks, so her, you know, who's, who's Spanish, you see. And I suddenly thought, now, if Deborah comes back, suddenly, right in this water, old friends, yes. there's this Spanish oh, woman who speaks. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> yes. Spanish. With two little daughters. And she's still with her man. That's the, It was fantastic, really, because the Red Mole was a very loose structure, and they would use anybody who wanted to be involved. Um, that doesn't mean that their standards were loose or sloppy, because there was always a, an incredible rigour about the way they worked. But at the same time, there was a looseness and, a, uh, say, a generosity and a willingness to include disparate elements. So they were really um, making themselves available to people as a structure to work inside. I don't know that that was very well understood at the time for what it was. I, I don't know that I understood it particularly well at the time, or at least not in the terms that I'm talking now. 
But in fact, that was how it worked. And if you wanted to be in there and there was something you thought you could do, you could. And um, I think that was very liberating for those of us who did take advantage of it. They had this show they were going to put on, and they needed an MC, and I knew nothing about it. Jean made me a costume, and it um, somehow evolved. I remember the first, I wore dark glasses because I was terrified of the audience, and I didn't want to see them, and I hardly saw them the whole time that I was Neville, and that was the reason. Often there was a spotlight too, which meant you couldn't see. Um, first thing I did was go out to Whitcomb and Tombs and buy these joke books, and none of that worked. And every time I mentioned something that was New Zealand, people reacted. So I started reading the paper instead, and that was better to get things out of the paper. And I, the, the thing that was the best thing that I discovered was to come out and say I was dreadful, that I knew nothing about this. I'd just got out of jail, and they'd given me a job. And then it didn't matter how dreadful I was. People liked it, and I kept that going all the way through, even on the TV thing, which didn't perhaps work so well, but the TV show was dreadful. So. OK, well, um, this is Butte Hughes um, reviewing Red Mole at, at the Ace of Clubs. Uh, good satire needs a sharp cutting edge. Red Mole used cudgels to try and batter its subjects into grotesqueness we're supposed to laugh at. Much of the show was offensive without being funny. Indeed, a large slice of the first half, with religion as its victim, was downright blasphemous. I wish I could do uh, his voice. He was English, I think. What happened in the second half, I cannot tell you, because I went home at interval, unable to stomach any more. Well, it always got much worse in the second half, didn't it? <laughs> um, that got us huge audiences. He, d he, he tried to kill the show, but when people read that, they came along. And uh, they were the people we wanted because they were people who were interested in the blasphemy and the satire and everything. So it did us a lot of good. That's how I became a songwriter. I was a poet and I haven't been since Red Mile. I've been a songwriter. And we would write things and then a week later, the, a band, Midge, I mean the Country Flies were a great band, they would play it on stage. And I've never forgotten that. And it's the reason I still write songs. That was a huge... And it made the theatre quite amazing. I remember there was a... We did a thing on the 50s and we found a story about an old guy who had been gay in Christchurch and these young kids found him in Hagley Park in the toilets and they killed him. And we got that newspaper article and we made a play about it and the band played Love Me Do and another ballady sort of a thing and we reenacted that murder in slow motion and it caused a fuss, but it was a beautiful piece of theatre. I mean, we did a Frank Sargison short story on stage, you know? And, and, it was and I mean, blue eyes smiling in the rain. Yeah, uh, but I mean, it was really... And it, I mean, if I was in the audience, I'm sure, I think someone said it, you'd... One... You would never know what was coming next. You would never know what was coming next. I have to say that Red Mole totally ruined my life because um, I'd been a serious young poet and a scriptwriter with a couple of quite good credits. And then when I did Neville, I could separate it, but I thought everyone else could, but they couldn't. And I eventually did a television series as Neville, and it um, was not well received by the critics, not surprisingly. I really took the Red Mole philosophy into it. So I was abusive, and I was amateurish on purpose, and it really was not the TV they were used to. They wanted a replacement for Norman Gunston, who had been in that slot. And although Neville had his fans, a lot, I got letters from people in prison and things like that, the average New Zealander didn't, didn't take to it. Um, when that TV series finished, I found I was unemployable. No one would give me script writing work. No one would give me work um, as anything. And in those days, broadcasting was the only employer. They erased all the tapes. There was a police case because I'd said... <laughs> But as 
good art. <laughs> Arthur was the only one who could out-hustle his alter ego, Neville, always trying to find the formula for the perfect hit show that would make us all rich and we'd go on forever and ever, and we'd never have to paste up our own posters again. After all the dead-end streets and the padlocked gates and no trespassing signs, a gigantic spectacle. So big we use a racetrack outside of town. And the queues are immense. People abandon their cars and cross the grass on foot. The ringmaster shouts through a megaphone. I lead the parade in a satin suit, as pink as a wound in a forget-me-not hat. Behind me walks a muscular man with a ladder. Three fat men, buried up to their waists, shout, Don't look at me, don't look at me. I climb the ladder and wave from the top. Over the grandstand, the moon comes up like a sponge pulled out of a heart during urgent surgery. A hundred women in pink climb a hundred ladders, and a huge Christmas tree is lit with neon stars and angels burning from the inside. Every night that summer after days that are long and hot. After Ghost Rock, we did a national tour called Going to Djibouti, which Sam Neill documented in the National Film Unit documentary Red Mole on the Road. Uh, we finished that tour in His Majesty's in Auckland about July, I think, July of 1978. And after that, the group basically split for a time. And Sally and Alan and Deb flew off to Mexico, and I stayed with the band Red Alert. And in September we also flew to America. But we kind of got stuck in San Francisco for quite a long time, eight or nine months, because they were essentially pursuing their musical ambitions. Um, and I was managing the band and doing their lights and just being that sort of general dog's body roadie kind of person, which I didn't really enjoy very much, and I didn't really enjoy San Francisco. But I felt quite impelled to get over to the East Coast and rejoin Red Mole, that's what I wanted to do. But I encountered a lot of resistance from the band who all wanted to be rock and roll stars and thought they could do it in San Francisco. And maybe they could have, I don't know, but in the end, uh, my counsel and the pressure we got from the other side prevailed. Off to court on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I lived in New York for 10 years. Not one thing that I get, you know, not one encounter with the police there. I get back here, I'm not back two years and I'm busted three times already. It's the old sort of story. Don't walk on the grass. <laughs> Hey, Ian! Doors open! Come up! Hi, Ian. Hi, Sam. Oh, what's this you're doing? That's that film with Deborah. Wow. Looks like New York. Yeah, it is. This is the Williamsburg Bridge. It's as cold it's as hell. Amazing. <laughs> Reminds me of the day I arrived in New York, yeah. February the 1st. Yeah, made it to West Bear Theatre Center, sat around and drank a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> Caught up on what had been happening. I'd you know, missed out on a couple of shows, but uh, 
there was, we were doing a puppet show. Anyway, Johnny took me back to the, ho the hotel up on 49th Street, subway up to 8th Avenue and 42nd Street. Didn't really know what the place was about then, and Johnny had, was a little bit paranoid at the time. He'd been maced at Christmas time. And uh, so we walked down 42nd Street, my first trip. Pooh, it was like being in a movie. Everything was just happening all around you. And he was, meanwhile, he was being paranoid about my bag. I'll sneak up behind you and <laughs> slit it with a knife and you'll lose everything. And I'm just sort of bug-eyed looking at everything. Neon lights, hookers, drug dealers, whatever, limos flying by. So I think it created quite a bit of tension all around that uh, the women were having to, you know, basically hold the group together financially. Um, even though we were getting quite good gigs, theatre for the new city and so on, which was a fairly prestigious theatre, off-off-Broadway theatre, it still is. But despite full houses, you know, the money didn't really come in. The boys decided uh, we needed to make a contribution to the financial situation since the women were taking care of us mostly. Um, so we decided to go out in the street and do a bit of New York busking. There was plenty of them out there. We thought, got to be a dollar in it. So we were on Broadway. Alan was reading his poem, Crippled Cockroach. John was playing the guitar, and I was lying in the gutter, kicking my legs. I think people thought it was quite funny, but they never gave us any money. <laughs> so I think by the time we got to London, the whole financial, financial situation was stressed out. And we were all pretty stressed out, living very closely together. Rehearsing, performing, you know, rehearsing new shows, performing that show, trying to get other shows together. And there was just a constant pressure to keep, keep on, on the move, which is part of the philosophy of the whole thing, I, I think. But when the financial situation gets critical, I think uh, the stress on people becomes critical. And I think London was the blowout for that. And I think everybody was feeling pretty down by that stage. Looking back at it now, I sort of see that the collective, and the traveling theater group, or traveling anything group, um, is a way to create an alternative to what the culture, what Western culture is trying to create. And that being on the move is a way to get outside uh, the restrictions of society, that places people in little pockets and says you must live this way, no, you can't do that. Yes, you can do that, we approve of this. If you're on the move, you know, you can leave the parking tickets behind so long as you don't come back too quickly. Uh, it's not necessarily a way of escaping, it's a way of creating a place that you can exist uh, in some kind of sane way in a world that seems to be pretty insane to me. Uh, which brings me to the point of where I'm going, Sally. I need a costume. Well, I need a jacket, a tie, a shirt, anything. Mm. I have to go to court. I got caught, a bean court. <laughs> so I have to go before the man. Well, there's heaps and of costumes here. Plead my innocence. <laughs> but it won't happen. Do you want to try something on? Yeah, I think I'll try and look respectable.
remember those first nights in New York. Coming home after dancing in the bars all night long. I can remember their names. The Wild West, the Adam and Eve, the Club, Exotica. We got to Washington and then we arrived in New York on April Fool's Day. Yeah, April Fool's Day, 1979. And I think we went straight to the theater. I remember walking into the theater, the theater for the new city on 2nd Avenue and 10th Street. And so I, I lit that show at the theater for the new city, which was last, the last days of mankind, which was a magical show. I thought it was a fairly antiquated theatre, but it was a very good show. It had um, it had an intensity and a focus that I don't think the New Zealand work had had. Um, so we did that. We got a fantastic review in the Village Voice. But after that, it was kind of the economic imperative came down hard on us and nobody had any money. And we all had to look for jobs. And that was when Sally and Deb went back to what they'd been doing at Carmen's a couple of years before and danced in the Adam and Eve, I think it was called, the club where they worked. Uh, and I got a job writing pornography. I answered, it, answered an advertisement in the Village Voice for a writer of adult fiction. But the whole idea of that was to earn money so we could get to London, which we did eventually do. Here's an old Red Mall favourite. I remember a time when everything was cheap But now the price is everywhere Put a man to sleep When you get your grocery bill, you just feel like making your will. Tell me, how can a poor man stand such times and live? Now the doctor comes around with his face all bright. And he says in a little while, it's gonna be all right. All he gives you is some kind of pill, a dose of dope, and a great big bill. Tell me, how can a poor man stand such times and live? Tell me, how can a poor man stand such times and live? In the late spring, we went to the... Uh, we went on this great exodus to London. And we all, at the time, I remember, went um, uh, in staggered groups because there'd been uh, an airline disaster and all uh, DC-10s, I believe, were grounded. And so Alan and Neil Hannon and myself got the last DC-10 out of New York City before they were all grounded. So we got to London first and sort of dug our way in, checked into a, a little boarding house in, in, on Oakley Street in, uh, in, in Chelsea. There was this guy with dreadlocks from uh, from Liverpool who just like sat around and smoked pot all day. And uh, what was his name? I forget his name. He talked. He was you know he was this. Uh, I think he was probably Jamaican, but he talked with this real Scouse accent. And I can remember him talking, sitting one day at the kitchen table with a group of us around. I think you and Alan were there. And uh, and somebody reading the paper and there was something about the Queen in the paper and he said. Yeah, the only thing that me and the Queen have got in common is we both got a dirty asshole. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I thought that was such wisdom. <laughs> what about the trip up north? Oh, the trip up north. The trip up north. <laughs> we, um, we got this engagement playing at this, <clears throat> at this Commonwealth Festival in, in Sheffield in South Yorkshire. And um, I remember getting transport from from the, uh, the New Zealand consulate. Embassy. Yeah, the New Zealand embassy, right. And uh, we, you know, they supplied a van and a driver, and we all piled into this vehicle, all kind of squashed up, you know. Uh, I remember some, well, no, I won't, I won't talk about that. But, uh, <laughs> right. 
Um, but we drove up there. <clears throat> we got to this place. At the time, we were, we were, um, well, we were hungry, you know, in in in, in every sense of the word. We were. Uh, We'd been struggling. Things had gotten kind of tough in London. So we were delighted to actually be going and doing some real work um, somewhere else <laughs> other than London. You know. So we get up there, and it's this Commonwealth Festival. Um, and if I remember rightly, we were the only New Zealanders there. Um, all the other Commonwealth countries were represented, including like lots of African nations, you know, Canada, Australia, had all had these kind of funded groups there, except for, except for us, who were this real kind of like bunch of tumbleweeds blew up from 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 London and uh, we roll up there and we we're formally announced you know I walk up to this guy um, who looked like sort of John Gielgud <laughs> and said uh, he announced it uh, what's your name he says I'm uh, Richard Kennedy he opens the door and goes Mr. Richard Kennedy and his voice echoes throughout the hall like, what <laughs> I took a real double take and uh, so I go in there and there's all these people milling around you know like Maid service and silver, silver trays. We all get announced this way, Miss Sally Rodwell, you know, Mr. Alan Brunton. You know, <laughs> that was the greatest. Um, so we get in there, and it's like, where's the sandwiches? <laughs> Do you remember um, the last show we devised in London that we took back to New York at puppet show? I, I'll never forget it. I think, <laughs> it, I think it was actually Dead for Fingers. me, Dead Fingers Walk. It was the, it was, um, it was my favourite show in that little. In the in the, the British period, <laughs> um, and it was its first performance was at the at the uh, New Zealand at New Zealand House in the Haymarket, and it was just a fabulous show. And I couldn't believe at the time how quickly it was put together. I mean, usually Red Mall shows are put together in record time, but this one was truly, um, you know, it was like shit through a goose. It was fast, you know. Every time I worked with Red Mall, I felt I feel completely apart from from any other music or entertainment that's going on right now. This is totally different. Okay? T Tennessee was the first stop after Manhattan, wasn't it? And we were on a we were on a high then, because New York had been so successful, really, and we developed quite a following. And the last season at the New City was a, a successful season, and it was a great show. And they loved the sort of thing where you where we would cut from puppets to live action, puppets coming out from behind the booth, all that kind of mix and match, which was quite new to them because they sort of like to have their form set and they stick in it. And that sort of thing really appealed to them. And also, I think, the traveling lifestyle of a troupe, which, to the Americans, they had bread and puppet theater, and that was the only other sort of group that they could relate to that worked like that. And so we would be compared to them. You know, punk bread and puppet, they called us. So there was a real high when we left that Second Avenue New City place in the basement. Oh, no, we were upstairs. We were upstairs for the second show, Dead Fingers Walk. So there was a real high when we left New York. The first stop was Tennessee. And um, I don't remember a whole lot about that, but I remember those guys being very suave and very well set up. And um, after our first night there, out came the cocaine, and there was this joke that this is what they were spending their grant money on. The theatre had bugger all lights, and <laughs> the dressing room was a shambles, but we were getting high and having a good time. So that was, that was all right with them. And he was the guy who said, you must go and see Levon. And we were in a little hotel in Springfield. And when, you, when we hit a hotel, a motel in those days, there was a bed and a sofa and the floor. So it was a, it was a, it was a competition as to who got the bed first of all. And I remember that time I was on the floor. And there was a knock on the door very early in the morning. And I opened the door and here was this chicken farmer standing there with his hat on and his old boots. And it was... Uh, Hi y'all, my name's Levon Hale. And we were sort of waking up and... But he just walked in and sat down and we had a great rave with him. And he gave us a bottle of strawberry wine, which is great drive in wine. 
<laughs> Dead fingers walk in the early afternoon. Blood on the staircase, whispers giving chase. Dead fingers walk. Two blue flowers on the door. Dead man on the second floor. Check out of a hotel on Tuesday afternoon. Put a gun behind the mirror in the bathroom. Hammers on the moon late last night. Now there's a pile of bones on a budget flight. One that says. And the way we were traveling, the way we were living, was that if you, you needed your money, then you just had to go out and do it on the street. And there was a market in San Antonio which was patronized pretty well on the weekends, but I think during the week it was a bit thin. So we arrived there on a Monday morning ready to go and um, backed up against one of the stalls and did our street performances maybe four or five times a day. It was, we found a spot. Yeah, we made money and we got the car repaired, um, doing the operation with the syringe and Glurbs. Glurbs was the huge great rubber gloves that the surgeon wore. <laughs> it was this incredible fun of taking the language somewhere else. People were fascinated with the language too. You know? The way we spoke was quite new and quite refreshing to their ears, to hear this different sound. People would be very fascinated to see the way we interacted on the stage and then get to know us as a, as a group and sense that that whole dynamic, that we were playing out aspects of our lives, aspects of our relationships that were right there on stage. Driving from San Antonio up to Austin, which was a really good town, Austin was really good to us, they sort of, we struck it at the right time. So we had a big crowd, and we did our cabaret show, and people responded to it incredibly well, you know, for all the different reasons. And then we were packing up afterwards, and I remember Alan and I lashing the trunks onto the top of the old Buick, and um, these people hanging around, and, saying, where have you been? And we'd been to England by that stage and come back. And um, how did you get to England? One of the master and Alan said, oh, we drove across. And there was this whole picture of driving the Buick across the Atlantic and back, which is what it felt like. I mean, that car was our home. And um, I love those American cars. That big Buick was an incredible thing. It was like a whole hotel suite on wheels. And then setting off at about 2.30 a.m to go across into East Texas and you sort of come up out of West Texas into the Panhandle, the Badlands. And it was just this incredible landscape and it was just on dawn and everyone else in the troop has crashed out at the back of the Buick and the sun's coming up and there was a little joint sitting in the ashtray and I just had a few puffs and it was just drive. No one else on the road and you just, you're going and you really know that you're doing it, you know, the, the, the uh, as a, as a troop, you, you just, you're going for it and you could go wherever you wanted to. And it was an incredible, liberating feeling. You lean on one another a lot. I mean, the incredible trust and bond that you develop with the other people that you could, you depend on them to such an extent. Was, wasn't the chemo where you had that accident? We were doing number days in paradise. Yes, I was on the crucifix again. <laughs> 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 and, and, and so now I'm at the bottom of the crucifix squabbling over a fire with the sun strung up. And then the whole thing just slowly began to tip. I remember borrowing a horse because we went to the reservations, didn't we, on Christmas Eve? Yeah. And we went to two different places. And it was sort of dawn by the time we got back to Taos. And I borrowed a horse and made a little mixture and a little um, bag of whiskey and lemon and things. And I set off, it was just after dawn, and there was a bit of snow still on the mesa. And I was going to ride to the Rio Grande, which was just that huge gold 
carved through the mesa going on down to the south. And I rode on the horse, and the horse wouldn't go any further at a certain point. So I got off and tied it up and walked to the edge and looked down the river. And it was just an extraordinary place to be. You could feel, you could sort of understand why George O'Keefe and such people end up there because there's such an incredible power in the, in the, in the landscape. And those huge, great purple mountains up the back where nobody went. It was Indian land. We thought about it the wrong way around. It was like we've got 50 bucks each to lose. So I went in with this sort of idea that I would, once I'd lost 50 bucks, that was my time. Um, rather than going in and think I've got 50 bucks to win my thousands with, <laughs> I was expecting to lose. And uh, yeah, we, did, we did lose. Birds of paradise, birds of Angola, dancing on my wrist. And a big yellow moon shines through Stamping on the paws of freedom Six rounds in, first into my hand My rifle, red hot like a saint on fire Listening to the sound of the jangles Listen to Shango dancing in the I think at the Odyssey Theatre in Los Angeles um, and I remember that show and those performances very clearly because it was Red Mole's last show in America. You know we'd all been together for quite some time um, at this point and at this photo session we all felt, well I felt, we felt very unified. And there certainly was about to be a major change because, of course, we came back to New Zealand and that was extremely different from all that time and all those performances in America. considerably younger and uh, I guess the, the, the joke of, of the 60s for me is that in the 60s we thought that anybody who was encumbered with possessions was uh, not free and of course in the 90s, um, 80s and 90s we've discovered that, that money is freedom. Every now and again I do gigs 
uh, could be teaching a, a, a friend's child the piano or it could be playing one night at a party or whatever. Um, but I do some things for nothing just to remind myself that the reason that I did music in the first place was because I loved it, not because I was being paid for it. From my experience, as soon as I stopped uh, trying to be successful in terms of the world, that I actually became successful. Um, and now I have very realistic aspirations, I guess. Um, I I feel very strongly now that if I've paid my rent and I'm in good health and relatively calm and happy, then that's fine. That's all I ask of life. Um, of course music is part of that because I'm not happy if I'm not playing music. Um, and really I feel very blessed, very lucky to have been able to have carried on what we really started doing in Red Bull. I am still doing that, and a lot of us still are. We meant it then, and we mean it now. Found in the back room of a rebuilt home on Love Canal. Mama was a cashier and Daddy worked for Ivan Watkins Dow. And when I was 12 years old, the fish came, came out of the cold. All the policemen on the beat, Calvin Boulevard and Frontier Street, whisper in their radios, watch which way the hard ring goes. It's Agent Orange doing the night shift. I threw your typewriter. What? I threw your typewriter down the lift well. <laughs> Smith Corona, the apocalypse. <laughs> we were earning top dollar in the clubs, and you were doing what? Performing in the. Sometimes you write these shows, you think this is going to be the last show that I'm ever writing. This is going to be the summation of uh, all this enterprise and effort. And each show becomes the summing up of your life to that point. All the bright moments in your life. 
and each show becomes the completeness of that life right up to the moment that is being performed by those people in that collective. And in each show, I like to put a moonrise. I like to have a full moon rising because in 1974, in Luang Prabang, we made a promise to form a collective traveling theater troupe. And a full moon came up over, a, over an opium den behind a shell service station. And the history of Red Bull has been those, those collection of bright moments ever since that time. And at times it's been in the middle of a crowd and at times it's been all alone. And the responsibilities, the things you had to do to keep a group of people happy as you pass through eras on highways. I think at the beginning the idea was to to maintain the romance of people being together and trying to avoid it becoming a crowd and swallowing you up and absorbing your personality. And over the years, people put in two, three years of working with Red Mole and then they just vanish. They just blow away into another, another reality altogether. And the collective survives and goes on. And someone comes down the road a couple of days later and says, you know, I'm looking for something to do something to help expand, and you turn to them and say, let's all expand together, let's grow, it's an expanding universe. And somewhere on the edge of the universe, there's, the, there's an infinite curve, and it's illuminated, and that's what you're riding on, and it's red hot, and it's a wave, and it's a wave to nowhere. To have a vision, you must leave home. You must travel. And you wonder what it is that you're moving towards sometimes, and it becomes, after a while, it becomes the quality of light. And you're searching for the light. And there's a, there's a passage by Borges where he, he says, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. But what if he had said some other word? What if he'd said dirt or mud or gold? What would it be like? And it's that curiosity that drives you on and on. Because each show, being the last show, leaves you fresh to start from the beginning all over again with the next show. And each show becomes an epic. There's a, this clawing up hills, up mountains towards the complete moonrise. And it might be a blood red moon. And it might be coming up in the middle of a glacier of stars. And out there at the beginning is the origin. You come back to your origin and you remember where you came from. And in those memories is the perfection that you were always looking for. Surprised me that she went bush, actually. Like to the desert at first, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, New Mexico and all, yeah. that, and then real Mexico, old yeah. Mexico. Yeah. Now Nicaragua. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Wow. Going more tropo as she goes. <laughs> Why did it surprise you? Well, I don't know. Um, she always seemed strong, but. Uh, I didn't think she was, I, don't, I guess I didn't know her that well. I didn't think she was that um, into exotic culture, I guess.
I was just going to ask you if you remember, you know, how you used to do all those posters for the shows, what you remember. It was like a very picaresque to me, you know, scene after scene, which were all lots of fun. And there was a shape to it, but um, there was so much dialogue, I couldn't um, necessarily follow a plot direction, you know. But that didn't seem to be the point. I mean, the, the, um, it was a really different like, presentation from Tully. So, um, you know, Tully had plots sewn up. Yeah. It was good to get away from it like that, you know, totally predictable. That's, right. that's when we did that song, Hey Rangitoto. Rangitoto, yeah, that was a that good song. That reggae song, yeah. yeah. Sitting in there, however, <laughs> the people, they come and go, but Rangitoto stay. <laughs> And another song on that show I used to love was um, I Just Want to Get Back to the Island. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yes, I held the waves. <laughs> and did, um, did this with the, the cardboard waves. <laughs> the big row of them behind the... I don't think you need to fill the gap um, for too long, probably. Everybody comes back. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I didn't go. I knew, yeah. I knew they would all be back. <laughs> mm. well, only I expect people to bring a few more bits back than they do. Bits of what? Bits of over there. I love this poster. I think everybody who has ever in Red Mall has kept this poster. It worked well, yeah, because it's so unusual. Oh. It's kind of odd that you don't get many posters of a parade in the desert. Okay, so I've just thought of About something. About this photo? Yeah. What? Deborah's middle name. Uh-huh. Louise. Louise? Yeah. I'd never have suspected that one. It's lovely, Deborah though. Louise. And, oh, yes. D.L. D.L. What's your middle name? Desmond. <laughs> <laughs> I gave that away straight away. I was too angry to rehearse. I was so isolated. I was nearly mad. I gave you $15. And a girl on the street took it out of your pocket. You were unreachable then. It was the time of division. We were like cells in a body tearing themselves apart, like planets in reverse. Staring out at Manhattan, we had visions. Oh, the black police, yeah, I, um, yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember making that. We had a few little, um, a few little hairy moments in that one, Sal. Do you remember the cameraman? Yeah, Tim Burns, the Aussie guy, yeah, yeah, you couldn't forget him in a hurry. Um, oh, I mean, just an Australian in New York, you know, they stick out like, um, like a sore thumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about Peter Rizzo? Yeah, Petey Boy. Petey Boy was, um, Italian boy from Brooklyn, um, he was in the film The Black Police, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Here we were, filming the filming on the Williamsburg Bridge three days after a triple hit, a triple murder, on the on the um, on the on the Upper West Side, about three blocks from where we live. Actually, there was this hitman abducted this woman. It was a contract job. He would abducted this woman, and he was carrying it, taking her through this car park to stick her in his van. And these CBS employees came out, and he, sh he shot three of them, you know, gangster style, in the head, before taking off with her and then murdering her. They found her body later that day, and we were filming on the Williamsburg Bridge three days after that with no kind of police permission. And um, the first thing I knew, a helicopter came in, you know, <laughs> and then. Um, Christ, all of a sudden, I saw people coming over the sides of the bridge. And I looked down, and there was the police launches and stuff down there. And and luckily, I was about 200 yards down. So I thought, well, I should just stay down here. <laughs> oh, you chicken. <laughs> because um, the place was swarming. And, and I, I looked around, and there was no cars coming across. It was a Friday afternoon. And there were no cars coming across the bridge either. And um, later we found out that we'd blocked the traffic in Lower Manhattan for about five miles down the road. There was a, there was a gridlock in, in Lower Manhattan that afternoon because of the 
because of us, us filming on the bridge. And later, I think Sally and and, um, and the rest of the people that got arrested that day had to go to court. And um, I think they got let off. I mean, I don't think they actually got anything bad happened to them. But, you know, um, it was pretty serious for a while there, I think. I miss the sort of activity, especially of New York City, you know. It was very... Um, it was busy, you know, it was busy, and it's not as busy here, um, for me, particularly, and uh, I miss that, you know, I mean, I maybe New Zealand will start to happen for me one day, and I hope it's soon, but um, I miss that aspect of, of um, New York. Oh, well, that's, there's the 70 bucks gone. <laughs> I'll just go and show them a bit of plastic. It was one of those days at a roadside station Outside of two cup carry, the sky was ashtray red, the sun was steady and still at 104 degrees. There was no water in the air, only those with nowhere to go would ever think about stopping there. Then a big bear belly pulled in from off the interstate, his face was a dying fire. Falling through the grave, his car was a lost cause looking for a mate. The crows left their trees when his feet hit the ground to say he was the sheriff in a town. We were sort of thrown together and then as time went on we found we had sort of more and more in common it was funny we found that we really got on well we had lots in common and we both had the same sort of attitudes to things and I was also under quite a bit of pressure from Jan at that time and so um, Tony would sort of Tony didn't take any bullshit from anybody so he was a good ally, really. And, um, you know, it just developed. I remember we drove in on April the 1st, thinking I thought this was a bit significant. For April Fool's Day in New York. <laughs> and driving on these cobbled streets downtown was just totally, I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't imagined New York was going to be like that. I thought that it would be sort of swept up, you know, like 6th Avenue or 5th Avenue with big buildings up. But downtown it was these little tiny cobbled streets and little sort of crumble, crumbling, falling down buildings. It was on 49th Street between Broadway and 8th, just on the edge of the, well, right in the heart of the red light, sort of Broadway seedy, tatty area, really. And for with our last sort of 50 bucks, got and went and got a battery-powered amplifier for tone, and that was the beginning of our summer on the street in New York. And we'd go out, you know, several times a day, and that's how we survived. Totally survived the first summer in New York. So September, October, you guys came back from London. It was John and Deb and Alan and Sally, Chris Whitten, and of course Ian Pryor. So everybody stayed on the floor at, in our hotel room. And then Richard joined up with, again with us to play on the street. It was the beginning, really, that was the beginning of the Drongos at that point. A very birth of the Drongos. You guys had left in October 1979, had done your tour of America across the West, come back to New Zealand for a year, and had been drawn back to New York. 
And what had pulled you back, the initial thing that had pulled you back was that Nancy Shatskin had found a theatre on Broadway that seemed perfect. She had some money to fix it up. It was underground. It was around the corner from the hotel consulate. And I remember particularly that sign that Deborah made on the outside. It was beautiful. I just remember great evenings going on for hours and hours, getting things right. Richard wrote a great guitar piece that I did, did some flute on the synthesizer over and everybody played stones. It was going to be like a country wedding, like a sort of a wild, sort of peasantish wedding. The, the brief was villages with blackened faces with flaming torches <laughs> striding through the village. <laughs> great images to work with. I was aware that it was a tradition that the music was quite strong, the music side of Red Mole. And, but I just didn't feel that confident. But you and Deborah were quite insistent and very inspiring. And you obviously had confidence in me. So I just did it. Been, it's been a great sort of focus for me because, you know, three kids, life can get very tedious and very domestic and you get very caught up with your own little world and I've always fought against that. I've always tried to sort of not live a mundane life. I never wanted to live a mundane life. I've always tried not to. <laughs> An old woman is changing her makeup while talking on the telephone. In another room, two other women are comparing their stockings. It is dark outside. Donkeys, joined by a bell rope, are being towed by a truck down a street. A child runs across the street. The driver slows down outside a particular house. The house is green. The windows have been taken away. Across the street, people are moving out. And other people are trying to move in. The old season ends. And already, we have forgotten how it began. Yes, can I help you? I have to get back. Back? Back. When? Today. Where? To the beginning. How about... 84? Yes. I'll be back in a minute. New York. How? Fly. Now, you'll need some of these. Here's the itinerary. Right, right have you got some passport photos, please? You Thank are. you. Hang on. I know you from years ago. That's what they all say. so much younger then. We all expected so much. And at this point the drongos were just about to break up, although I didn't know it at the time. 
but was sort of felt like it was coming near the end of an era. I wrote music for another show, Lost Chance for the Living. And by this stage, I was pregnant with Carmen. And then you guys left. You know, you came to New York a couple of times, and then you went to Amsterdam. I'm packing my bags for a long black train, walking down to the station. What if the train doesn't stop here? But there are hundreds with suitcases marching down the hills. The train does stop. We all push each other on board. My suitcase falls apart. I have to bend over to tie my boots. The train leaves. It takes hours to collect all my things in paper bags. At the end of the day, a celebrity stands beneath my tree. We stroll towards a long highway. A car stops. The celebrity gets in and closes the door and never looks back. Never, ever looks back. And the last time we performed it was in the legislative chamber at Parliament on the 50th anniversary of Savage's death. And it was quite an extraordinary occasion and very emotional um, occasion as well. I think I'd never actually spent a lot of time in Parliament and in those buildings or in that space at all. So going in with all of our props, with all of the costumes, the, the banners, um, the, the, the red flags flying, the little corrugated cardboard state house, the mask, the masks, Karl Marx, the coats with capital and labour um, printed on the back of them, and the, the, the costume that I wore before, which was the, the solo mother with all of the children that Sally made, and all of these amazing uh, objects that were part of the show and which even when they were not actually being used they had a life of their own and I uh, took on the task of uh, setting up the tables with all of our things laid out and I actually started doing uh, the ironing which was an extraordinary thing to do in the middle of this uh, it was a mundane and domestic task to do in the middle of these these sort of powerful corridors and um, I remember Roger Douglas coming by and sort of muttering under his breath the, what's this, garage sale? It wasn't Parliament any longer, it was backstage and, and, I, and I loved that. Let me say this, woman must take the future into her own hands. She's her own proletariat. What does it profit a woman if she marries the working man and becomes a slave to a slave. No, she will not stand in Ethereum, in the massed choirs of the patriarchal apocalypse. She will build her own temple, an incandescent temple of solidarity with her own sex in joyful freedom. Little sister, let me say this to you. Take love where you find it. Drink deep of the cup. And when the cup is empty, throw it away without regret. The question that M Michael Savage asked, the, the, the question is clear. What is the most in goods and services, culture and leisure, that the government can give to every citizen? And uh, I mean, I don't think they ask questions like that anymore. Anyway, the work we're doing now, the, the nobodies, is, is, um, comes out of that tradition, I guess. And, uh, and, the, and the work goes on, and the work is endless.
Hello, Peter. Hello, Sally. Can we talk now? Sure, why not? As everyone thought it was a big happy family, but it wasn't. It operated on levels. The, the, the one level was Alan, Sally, Debbie, and Peter, Peter um, Fantle. Um, an, another level was sort of close friends, people like Arthur and Jean and that. And then there were, there were always these people, sort of this parade of people because the musicians changed and sort of people, so people like Chrissy Klocek and that who came and went. Um, and, and also this thing about, about the decision making, that, that you had this neat device of always having someone to, to sort of pass the responsibility on to. It was Peter Fantle or it was um, Johnny Warren or, or it was Craig Miller and the, 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 the person who kept the books was always sort of the, the, the ultimate villain. Um, but, but from, from the technical point of view, that, that basically you know, we, we just did our thing because we, we understood what you're doing and as long as you could be sort of heard and seen, that, 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 uh, that didn't matter. I mean, we, we did talk about things, and we'd, I know that I tried to achieve what, what you wanted, but um, sort of quite often I used to sort of say, oh, God, you know, here we go again, yes, 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 and went off and did what I thought was best and never heard any more about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the most interesting show technically would, would have to be Ghost Ride. I mean, Ghost Ride had everything. It, it had a great um, turbine up the back, blowing air and, and things. The, the opening sequence of, of Go Ghost Ride was a show all on its own. All these things were happening. The band was playing triple forte. And because everything that was happening was, was so full on that the, the punters were, were just blown apart. <laughs> <laughs> I I came back to the hotel with a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. All over the bed. The tension of being actors, of always being someone else, made us like High tension power cables falling all over each other. I first met the Red Moles in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and sometime in 1985, when they came down to do a production called Dreaming's End. They presented it in a kind of beautiful old adobe cathedral in downtown Santa Fe. Then the sort of winds of fortune in my life sent me into the southern, sort of the, the Antipodes, and was in Australia uh, uh, working, teaching at the University of Adelaide for a period. And, got to see a third production of Red Moles, which was the um, Book of Life in Adelaide at the Fringe Festival. Ready for you. Hope you're ready for us. At last. Let's go. The Book of Life. Due to overwhelming need and demand. The Book of Life. In language that is frank and daring. No. no veiled hints. No. no. Prudish beating about the bush. The Book of Life. We go into the sacred places of your in a life right, right now. now. This is the place. place. At last, the book of life. Anyway, uh, we're working on a kind of sort of a intercontinental collaboration here. I've been working on the score for the, the, most of the mid-June, early July, and we'll come back in the spring, I guess, this hemisphere to complete and perform the work. We've sort of decided that's the millennium coming up, so it's time to sort of latch on to the millennium theme and take it where it can go. I'm not much good at distances. You're living someone else's life. Here and now and always desiring to be 
in an unlit room beside you, wanting nothing but the best in this and everything. Last night, for the first time, I cried over you. Maybe it will burn me. I've listened to a lot of people talking about their lives. I've realized that at many times our lives were the same, that we came together and made performances, that we made theater. That was our life. Our lives are the same. A community of people who collectively made performance, made entertainment, traveled together, took a journey. And the journey isn't over because everyone's still on the bus. Everyone's still doing it. That's what we know how to do. The spark is still there, the fire is still there. The passion is there. Every single person I talk to is still filled with that passion. Now that's why I'm glad I did it. And it's been very hard. And this moment is very hard because it's coming to an end. Most of all, I want to say thank you to all those people who made my life a life of theatre. A performance. I'm Sally. Thank you. After the denouement, it had segued into a fairground scene with acrobats, magic, a strong man, snake oil quackery, dancing and music with fire eating to close. They trooped around North Island camping grounds and small town halls, finishing up on the East Coast. Bay of Plenty, East Cape, Hawke's Bay, Mahia Peninsula ends. But a beautiful closing rhythm it had.